Well, hey, welcome to the message. Here at Colonial Church, we're all about loving God, loving people, and loving life. We pray that this message would be practical and inspiring for you in your everyday life. God bless you. Hey, how y'all doing? Everybody feel good tonight? How many of y'all want God to do something amazing in your lives tonight? Amen. I believe it's a night like tonight where when we come with expectation, when we come with hope, and we come with desire, that we can experience a level of freedom that we've never experienced before. This could be your night of breakthrough. This could be the night that has been prepared for you since the beginning of time, where the things that you've been stuck in a cycle, that God just does a divine intervention right in the middle of your pain, right in the middle of your mess right now. Come on, somebody. And so I'm a little bit excited tonight. You already have a little church? Let's go. Y'all can have y'all seats. Why don't you give your person next to you a high five? We like to say in Baltimore, say, that's what's up. That's what's up. Let's teach y'all a little hood lingo tonight. Uh, I am excited uh, to be here uh, in, uh, where am I? St. Augustine. <laughs> I got in a hotel. I was like, are there any black people around here? Come on. <laughs> My God. I was like, is this an episode of Get Out? Like a sequel? <laughs> and uh, then I saw my sister here, and I was like, yes, we're good. We're good. Actually, when I met your pastor, I uh, realized we got on a bus, and him and I were the only two minorities. <laughs> this Australian guy, this black guy, I was like, I'm safe, I'm good. And uh, just so amazing uh, how God just brings divine connections into your life. And, you know, you never know how God is setting you up for a miracle, right? You, you, never, you never know how God is setting you up for an encouraging word. Uh, I believe that nothing just happens uh, and I believe that every day we wake up with just this show me something mentality. Abraham had a show me something mentality. God said, I'm going to take you a place. I'm going to show you and I'm not going to give you directions. So every single day I got to wake up with God. Let me not get familiar with what, I'm, what I've experienced and where I'm in. God, let me have a show me something mentality. Amen. And I think it's absolutely amazing what God has done here at your church in just under four years. Come on, two years just doing church. Can y'all just give it up for the vision here? Okay, that, that'd be okay in a white church. Tonight, this is a black church. I said, can y'all just give it up? <laughs> Amen. You're amazing pastors and leaders, and uh, just honor them and uh, honor their sacrifice, honor. Uh, I know it costs a lot as I lead a church with my family, and, and uh, we just, we love you. We, we, I just felt like, you know, it's my brother from another mother, my sister from another mister. <laughs> and... Uh, I just thank God for you. I thank God for the vision of this church. And I just want to be very, I just want to caution you for a second because what happens is, is when we start off a church and God's called it to be more than it is, we can get familiar with what we've been used to. Uh, and, and I honestly think that familiarity is the robber of faith. All right? And, and be careful not to call regular what others would call revival. Man, and what you guys are experiencing here is amazing. And I'm just excited of your days ahead. Uh, we are a latter day, you know, not latter day saints, but latter day Jesus. <laughs> the glory of the latter house will not be compared to that of the former house. That means God, every single day you wake up, God releases new vision. And, and uh, I never want to just get familiar. I don't want to stay in the same place that I'm at. And so I thank God uh, that we're here and and uh, uh, I am excited. I, I just to give you a little bit. Of, I don't know if my if my assistant sent the picture of my family or not. Uh, but if she didn't, I'll just talk to you about my family. If she did, you can put it up. And um, but uh, I've been married uh, 20 years. Uh, 20 years. Amen. <laughs> Some of y'all like really? Yeah, black don't crack. <laughs> I'm 45 years old. I'll be 46 in January. I have an 18 year old daughter. Uh, she's in Bible college. I have a 17-year-old son. We don't know if he's a Christian. You can laugh. It's true. Uh, and I have a 14-year-old uh, daughter, Maya. And I just absolutely love ministry. I love doing ministry as a family. Uh, I didn't always love that. And I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit of my story a little bit tonight. And, and uh, I, I took over, as, as Pastor said, I took over my parents' church uh, in 2011. Uh, and we were, uh, God has called me to diversity. And uh, I believe the call on my life is to uh, just, just get people to think differently about other cultures and uh, other age groups. And different doesn't mean better. It just means unity. Yeah. And Psalms 133 says, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell, not brothers, dwell together in unity. It says there, I will command a blessing 
And I believe that whenever God sees unity, he releases suddenlies. And all throughout scripture, whenever there's unity, there was suddenlies that took place. And come on, in the upper room, there were, there were 120 on the same page and God just reuse, released suddenlies. But we have to be careful uh, to not allow uniformity and call it unity. And, uh, and so I'm gonna, I get a chance to travel and speak on diversity, and I'm going to kind of integrate, I'm gonna integrate that into my message tonight. And, uh, but um, uh, we started a church, and, and my, my church that I took over from my parents, I hated it. Um, <laughs> it was it, like I love my parents. I just hated our expression of church. And, you know, there was about 10 Jericho marches a Sunday, and we had, we had king chairs on the stage, and you know, three-piece, eight-piece suits and <laughs> gators that weren't from Florida. They were just on your feet, and it's just weird. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but God told me, I, me and my wife, we, we wanted to go and do something different, and God said the, the specific word that I felt the Holy Spirit gave me on a mission trip is, I've not called you to birth a baby. I've called you to resurrect the dead. <laughs> and, and that day, I just decided that God was going to use my misery and turn it into my ministry. And, uh, and absolutely what I've experienced from, from you know, racism and prejudice, like I, I, it's a part of uh, what God has called me to help break up the fallow ground. And uh, I'm just excited. Uh, our church back then was 99.5% African American because my wife is biracial. <laughs> Half of her claps on the one and the three, the other one on the two and the four. <laughs> Her likes green bean casserole, the other half likes green bean casserole, <laughs> green beans, and greens, and ham hocks. And <laughs> uh, I'm not a comedian, um, but the joy of the Lord is my strength, and I'm strong. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so I pastor a church called I-5 City, and you may say that's a unique name, and it is on purpose. Uh, because we can get so caught up in, in what we're called, we're not being who God called us to be. And uh, God, we, we purposely did that in Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples, and it's a depiction of Judgment Day, actually. And he says this, he says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick and in prison, you cared for me. And there I find five missional points of every church, food, water, shelter, clothing, and care. So God's called us, I-5 Church, uh, which we are still predominantly African-American, but uh, what we wanted to do is we went in our name not to be a presentation, but a conversation. And so we want to impact the world in food, water, shelter, clothing, and care, which is I-5. And uh, we believe that God has placed us in Baltimore City to be the tangible hands and feet of Jesus. We say that church doesn't start when service starts. Church starts when service is over because I don't go to church. I am the church. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I'm letting you know, the church got on a plane all the way, come on, from Baltimore here. When you walk up in the sizzler later on, it's the church. Come on, somebody. And so I'm excited uh, about God's word. I'm excited uh, about what I get. I, I, I honor every time I get a chance to bring God's word. I believe it's powerful. I believe it can change your life. I believe that one moment in God's presence can rock your world and change everything uh, that the enemy meant for bad. God can turn it around for your good in one moment. How many of y'all believe that tonight? Amen. Why don't you turn your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 16, uh, 22 and 24, and I'm going to skip around. And, and what I love about Sunday nights is I don't have to be professional. Come on, somebody. I got a hoodie on. I got my, my J's on. I, you know what I mean? I ain't even showered for a week. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, but I love this passage of Scripture, and I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about our story tonight. And what I'm going to encourage you to do tonight is, is to be real, authentic, transparent, and vulnerable with yourself. I, I believe that, you know, we can, we, can, we can answer altar calls, we can read Scripture, but unless we are willing, we cannot conquer what we are not willing to confront on the inside of us. And I'm excited about this passage of Scripture and this message because this is a little bit about our story, and I believe you'll get to know me a little bit. I'm just going to pick through this passage of Scripture. It might be familiar uh, uh, with you. This is the greatest jailbreak ever. That's biblical. Come on, somebody. Uh, uh, it says this, a mob formed quickly against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them to be stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. They were thrown into jail. They were locked up. They were 
chains were put on their ankles and their hands, and they were bound, and they were put in the inner prison. Somebody say the inner prison. It says the jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape, so the jailer threw them into the inner prison, the inner dungeon, the inner jail, the inner place of captivity, and clamped their feet in stocks. I want to preach to you over the next few minutes on this topic that there's purpose in the prison. Look at the person next to you. Come on, my black preacher, and tell them there's purpose in the prison. Tell them, I'm glad glad you're in church tonight. Tell them, come on, tell them. Now look at your second favorite on the other side of you and say, you look like you could could use a little bit of church. Tell them, you you need a little Jesus in your life. You need a breath mint, too. There's purpose in the prison. I used to be a worship leader, and... Uh, uh, and I remember working for my mom and dad and leading worship and, and you know, uh, uh, in our context of church, like, although church was at 9 o'clock, nobody showed up to about 10 o'clock. Uh, but call time for the worship team was at uh, uh, 8 o'clock, and we would get there at 8 o'clock, and if you've ever been a part of a volunteer, uh, we'd have a huddle or, or we'd go over the worship set. And, and I remember, like, I was the worship leader, but I was a different kind of worship leader. I, I led worship from the drums. Come on, somebody. And I, I had one of those Janet Jackson mics. Come on, somebody with the big, back then they had the big poofy thing that had germs and it was infected and blocked your mouth and no one could see what you were saying. And, and I remember, you know, being so excited and, 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 and I remember uh, it was just two of us. It was me and, and my friend Steve. Somebody say Steve. Uh, and Steve was our keyboard player. And, and, and Steve had come to Jesus Christ uh, from selling drugs off the street. And, and uh, God has always given me this, this, this vision to help musicians. And I've always been able to walk with musicians. And I love the musicians at our church. And just, just give them a chance and an opportunity and, and mold them and, 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 and really mentor them. And, and I remember Steve uh, called time was eight o'clock there was no Steve at eight o'clock I called Steve and Steve didn't answer the phone I texted Steve and Steve didn't answer the text and I was a cussing worship leader that Sunday I'm joking and I was like dude where is Steve and 8 30 came and 8 45 and there was no Steve nine o'clock there was no Steve 9 30 there was no Steve 10 o'clock there was no Steve 10 30 so we sang a cappella. come on somebody we just made it work when you're a worshiper, I don't need no music. Worship is in my heart. No, you're not. Come on, somebody. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would offer your body as a living sacrifice, which I will add that I believe that the greatest move, the next move of God in the church is when we take worship and move it, move it from lyrics to lifestyle. So there was no Steve. 10 o'clock, there was no Steve. 11 o'clock, there was no Steve. I'm texting Steve, where are you at? 12. 1 o'clock, the first fish fry was over. Steve wasn't there. <laughs> where in the world is Steve? 3 o'clock, no Steve. What happened to Steve? 6 o'clock, no Steve. Then I went to bed that night, no Steve. Steve sent me a text the next morning, you're going to kill me. I said, well, you're already fired, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> He said, you'll never guess where I was. I said, I won't. But where were you? He said, I was in jail. I was locked up. I said, you got to be kidding me. He said, yeah, I was in jail, and I wanted to call you, but I didn't want to use my only call to let you know I was going to be late. (laughs) True story. I said, what happened? He says, I got pulled over on the way to church. I was driving on a suspended license. And I got pulled over, and I had no idea because he has a history and he has a past. And he got locked up, and I said, well, tell me about it. And he goes, dude, you'll never guess what happened. Uh, uh, I just had a suspended license, and they put me in a holding cell with a dude that had just committed or or attempted murder. And I was like, so what'd you do? He's like, I lied. (laughs) I don't want to get beat up. So he was like, what you went for? What you went for? Well, I just beat these fools down. Steve can't fight. We're looking for our worship leader, and we realized that our worship leader was locked up. Can I be honest with you tonight that I believe that we've, a lot of us, we've been in church, and we've been doing church, and if we're honest, we've been going through the motions, and we've got worship leaders who have inner prisons. We've got dream team members who are free on the outside, but they're in inner prisons. 
We've got pastors and leaders who, who, who proclaim God's word and read, read God's word. But if we're honest, we've never really experienced a true breakthrough in our own lives. We have church people who tithe, who show up, who serve, who come to church faithfully in inner prisons. Inner prison of isolation. The inner prison of anxiety. The inner prison of fear. The inner prison of addiction. The inner prison of emotional wounds. And if I'm honest, if we're going to take this gospel to a whole nother level, we're going to have to get freed from our own prisons inside the four walls of the church before we do prison ministry on the outside. We've got to do some inner prison ministry. This is exactly what we find Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas were just doing life. Paul and Silas were just doing ministry. They were spreading the gospel, and they end up falsely accused. Have you ever been in ministry, and you're, 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 you're working on the body of Christ, but your own family has falsely accused you or betrayed you, and you feel like, man, what is going on? And you've got an inner prison in your family. Paul and Silas, I love this, it says they just left Lydia's house. Don't Lydia sound like she can cook? I want to eat at Lydia's house. <laughs> Scripture says Lydia's house. And many of us, what happens is, is we get full on worship and we get full on the things of God and we get full off of serving. But what we have allowed is we have allowed our work for God to become a substitute of time with God. And then we're going through the motions and we have no idea that we answer altar calls, but we never take the keys to unlock our soul from grief, from our past. Paul and Silas were doing ministry. Paul and Silas were just trying to spread the gospel, and rumors are spreading about them. They're preaching God words, and the hurtful, negative words are eating away at their soul. The people who said that they'd be there, Paul, come on, somebody had just been uh, disappointed by Barnabas. And so many of us, it could be that God wants to free us, but we're so busy talking about what Barnabas did and talking about how Barnabas left us and talking about how Barnabas betrayed us that you're sitting next to your Silas to help you free, get free from the prison that you have been in, but you're missing. You're missing Silas because you're so disappointed in talking about Barnabas. I believe we spend too much time on the past. Man, this is where I found myself. 2012. Started this church in 2011. In the first year, we went from 500 to 1,300 people. God was moving. We baptized 555 people that year. And, man, I started getting wins in the wrong area. Can I tell you what I believe? That the biggest force against what God wants to do in moving the church forward is when leaders are winning in the wrong areas. The worst thing I believe a leader can do is win at the wrong thing. I was winning at church, had a great ministry at church. The bride of Christ was growing, but I was neglecting my own bride in the inner prison. I had a great kids ministry, man. Our kids ministry was awesome, but I had no personal ministry with my own kids. I could travel and preach to thousands, pastor, but couldn't talk to the one I laid next to every night. Inner prisons. Inner prisons. We had church leaders with inner prisons. We got people in charge with inner prisons. We got people who lead teams but can't lead themselves in inner prisons. Can I just be honest with you? There's a bunch of prisons in here tonight. And what happens is we don't want to tell nobody. Man, I remember traveling 
And because I wasn't pastoring home and, and because, you know, uh, my anger issues started to resurface and, and I would come home from preaching on the stage. And, and honestly, uh, uh, we would, the fights were so bad in our house. There were holes in the wall and things in the wall because I would kick holes in the wall and punch holes in the wall. And I had no idea that my little girl at 10 years old, now 18, was, was, was crying and putting pillows over the other kids, crying them to sleep as mom. Mommy and I thought I would leave the platform and be a completely different person off the platform because I had an inner prison. Oh my gosh, he's transparent. <laughs> Man, when you're free, you don't mind saying what God has done. Look what the Lord has done. And because I wasn't pastor at home, Something else started pastoring my wife. Alcoholism. I had no idea that the one glass of wine would turn into the two glasses of wine, would turn into three glasses of wine every night, would turn into a full bottle every night, would turn into fights, would turn into a, a, a life that was unmanageable, would turn into a, a, a addiction where, where now the things that are most valuable to her, she's compromising, driving the kids in alcoholism. Turning to replacing water bottles with straight vodka. I'd be out on the road preaching and my daughter would text me a picture of mom passed out in the tub. Because we had inner prisons. Remember, it all came to a head one Easter, 2012. Thousands of people are going to come to hear, Pastor Jimmy, I don't know what to say. I don't have a word. My prison, I've been locked up so much. I, I, I don't even know what I was saying. I don't even know what I was doing. I'd stayed at a hotel all week, and the first time I saw my wife all week was on the front row, and I never said a word to her. And I remember going to the green room after hundreds of people gave their life to Jesus and marriages were healed. And I just begin to sob and I just begin to weep because I was jealous of the people who left my altar call with a breakthrough. And I'm going to leave church still bound up. Because I had an inner prison. Every time I shared this, I get emotional. Had an inner prison. We've got pastors in inner prisons. We've got leaders in inner prisons. We can't keep leading locked up. We can't keep showing up to church acting like that the power of Jesus is not for us and it's for everybody else. Man, I called my overseer and I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to quit. I, I don't know what to do. And, and I'm going to tell you, he says, listen, you are called. Come on, somebody. He says, for the promises of God are yes and amen. He said, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans for a hope in the future. But I was so locked up, I couldn't look past right now because of the inner prison. My feet couldn't praise because of the inner prison. My hands couldn't worship because of the inner prison. And if we're honest, some of us are locked up tonight. Can I encourage you, though, that last Tuesday, my wife celebrated four years of sobriety. Uh, I'll shout around this stage right now. I will Jericho march around this platform right now. What I came to tell you is he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And you can find freedom tonight. You can find healing tonight. You can find joy tonight. You can find deliverance tonight. You can find a breakthrough tonight. If you says, man, there's power in the name of Jesus to break the chains of depression, to break the chains of fear, to break the chains of isolation, and you can have freedom in your marriage. Not only is she celebrating four years of sobriety, I'm celebrating three years of food addiction. I was 420 pounds. And I had no idea that the grace that I offered her was actually going to be my own freedom and her helping me through the situations that I was in. You never know what's on the other side of a breakthrough in your life. 
How many of y'all says, Pastor, I want to get set free, man. I want that same kind of joy. I want that same kind of freedom. I came to tell you that what the enemy meant for bad, come on, somebody, God can turn it around for your good right now. I dare you tonight in the midst of this message to prophesy over your situation and to call things that are not as if they already are in the name of Jesus. Paul and Silas, man, they got out of that prison. This is the biggest prison break ever. Come on, somebody. They had a praise party in the midst of prison. How did they get set free? How did they get healed? How did they get delivered? How did they break out, number one? If you want to break free from the prison, this is what I found. If you want to come out of hiding, if you want to get real, you got to find your people. It's not going to sound like good English, but look at the person next to you and says, are you my people? <laughs> you got to find your people who will stick with you and see nothing seasons. It says in Acts 16, and around midnight, Paul and Silas. And around midnight, Paul and Silas. And around midnight, Silas and Paul. And around midnight, Paul and Silas. And around midnight, Silas and Paul. And around midnight, Maddie and Jill. And around midnight, Jill and Maddie. And around midnight, Irene and Jimmy. And around midnight, Jimmy and Irene. Who will stick with you in see nothing seasons? Come on, somebody. When the voices of your past are louder than the voices of your purpose, I'm here to tell you it's not about church all the time. It's about who's with you outside of the four walls of church. I'm sorry I'm a little loud, y'all. I just, I'm passionate for your breakthrough tonight. Uh. I just want to see some people experience what I feel right now. You got to find your people. It's crazy how the enemy will use the hurts of Barnabas to rob you from having a Silas in an inner prison. The Bible says, confess your sins to God that you may be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another, people that you may be healed. Pastor Matty, what I've come to find out is many people in church are walking around healed, forgiven but not healed because they don't trust people. I don't want to just make it to heaven forgiven. I want to have heaven on earth healed. Come on, somebody. We can't say thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, God, I want to have the atmosphere of heaven here on earth because the atmosphere of heaven comes and it changes us and it reframes us and it resets us and it forgives us and it heals us. But it's in the context of people. Yeah. Who's your people? You got to find your people. I'll never forget when I called one of my best friends, an overseer in my life now, Pastor Dino Rizzo. And I said, man, I can't do this anymore. I quit. And he didn't say, I'll pray for you. Any hey, y'all, anybody are tired of that? Just <laughs> praying for you. No, you're not. Because you're not even praying for yourself. Praying for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes I need somebody to show up. He, 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 he got on a plane from, from Birmingham, Alabama, without telling me, and knocked on my door and said, I'm your people. Let me tell you, the next level of transformation for this city uh, uh, is not just a church service. It's you actually being the church and showing up at the doors of people and saying, how can I serve you? And how can I, how can I be with you through the city? Is there anything you're going with? And, and, and watch this, without judgment, I like to tell our church, be careful judging people just because they sin differently than you. Yeah. Who are your people? And at midnight, where are your people? Everybody wants to be with you when you're on the stage. But who's with you in the dark? 
Who's with you when you got more month than you got money? Who's with you when you need counseling? You got to find your people. Your people are your people who bring accountability. Somebody say accountability. Accountability is people in your life or not just in your life for a gossip session. Come on, somebody. Not just to tell a confession. Accountability is people who know what you're capable of, but also what you're created for. I got to have people in my, in my life that says, hey, what you're going through and what you're doing right now is not who you are. God has called you. You're going to make it through this. I'm here to tell you, you got to find your people. My dad growing up was a prison warden. He, he, he ran all the prisons and, and built the prisons in Baltimore City. And he said the first thing they do in the most troubling form of punishment in jail is to put you in solitary confinement. To make you think you're all by yourself. And what they do is they first pat you down and make sure you ain't got no weapons. So you can't hurt yourself. And then when you really mess it up, they put you in the inner prison. It's ironic to me that Scripture explicitly says that this is the inner prison. This would have been modern-day solitary confinement. But how, what is the, how does Paul and Silas break out of jail? Because the enemy took every weapon that he could, but he messed up in one thing. He tied them together. Oh, I wish I had a church that says, who am I tied to? Who am I tied to in the midst of this isolation? Who am I tied to? Because scripture says where two or more are gathered in my name, there I'm in. Look at the person next to you and says, I'm going to go through this with you. I'm going to be there. I'm not just going to pray for you. I'm going to show up. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to love you when I don't agree with you. I'm not going to point out your sins. I'm going to point out the Savior, and I'm going to point out your purpose, and I'm going to point out your call, Paul and Silas, Silas and Paul. I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because I'm sure that at times Shadrach was like, I just can't do it. Uh, this fire is hot, and Abednego was like, boy, you better get through it. You better get your confidence on. Your praise is a weapon, and there were times when Abednego was like, I don't know if I can do it. But before the fourth man showed up, there were real men in the fire with you. Who's going to be in the fire with you when all hell is breaking loose in your life? <laughs> Got to find my people. When you find your tribe, you'll find your vibe. Come on, y'all. I got bars. Anybody want to break out of the prison? Find your tribe. Find your people, number two. Once I find my people, I can find my praise. Ooh. Ooh. And at midnight. Somebody said midnight. midnight. And at midnight, Paul and Silas. What were they doing at midnight? Praying and singing hymns to God at midnight. To the degree that other people who weren't in the inner prison were listening. In other words, your coworkers are watching, are you really saved? And at midnight, Paul and Silas were singing. Somebody say midnight. You see, I got an idea that we don't really understand midnight. Because when you do the math, midnight really only lasts 60 seconds. What? You didn't realize that just because it's still dark doesn't mean it's not a new day. Uh-huh. 
Midnight only lasts, somebody say 60 seconds. That's why the Bible says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It doesn't need to be light outside for me to experience joy right now. I'm going to do a little teaching on praise. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about old school. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. How many of y'all remember that? He's under my feet. He's under my feet. Satan is under my feet. Uh, what happened? We don't realize what praise is. I was watching football today. I don't know who, who's y'all's team down here. Jacksonville Jaguars? Because ain't a whole lot of touchdowns going on right there. I was watching Lamar Jackson. Watching my Ravens. And I realized something. It's crazy to me that people will paint themselves, take off their clothes, come on, in the freezing cold for a guy who's done nothing eternal, for a guy that hasn't changed anything but the bottom line. From a guy who may score a touchdown, but has never rolled back a stone. I don't understand why we come into church and we get reserved. That's too much. Can I tell you that the presence of God is not a respecter of personality types. But God is looking for some people that will praise in the midst of a dark season. He's looking for some people that will jump on their feet and say, look what the Lord has done. What I'm here to tell you is, what happens is, is when the world praises God, they praise God after a touchdown. But when the church praises God, they praise God before the situation changes. I dare you. Come on, white folks and Augustine. Get up on your feet and let the enemy know that what the enemy meant for bad. He is under my feet. I'm going to take my joy back. I'm going to take my peace back. I'm taking my deliverance back. I want you to touch three people and tell them, look what the Lord has done. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. He's behind me. I'm going to stop telling God how big my enemy is, and I'm going to start telling my enemy how big my God is. My dad said, when they lock you up, they pat you down. Making sure you don't have a weapon. But it says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas were praising God. The enemy can take your confidence. He can take, come on somebody, your finances. He can even take your house. But the one thing he can't touch is your voice. I'm here to tell you your voice is a weapon. I'm here to tell you when you don't know what to say, I just want you to open up your Bible and says for the promises of God are yes and amen. No weapon formed against me is going to be able to prosper. I'm the head and I'm not the tail. I'm first and I'm not last. I am above and not beneath. When you don't know what to say, Rip open your Bible and say what God says about your situation. Find your people. Find your praise. Here's what happens. Because celebration results in habitation. And habitation results in liberation. So if you want to be liberated, start celebrating. 
We don't praise because we scored a touchdown. We praise because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to hell and got the keys to the kingdom to unlock your destiny. And just in case you didn't know, your enemy is already defeated. There is power. Give me that key, whatever that is. I don't know what it is. In the name of Jesus. I don't know what they were singing. In my, in my story, there is power. In the name of Jesus. See, we sing songs, but we don't appropriate the power to our situations. There is power. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Uh -huh. To do what? To break every chain. Break every chain, break every, not some chains. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. I'm telling y'all, I got, when my wife was at rehab for 45 days, and we had taken 100 days off from our church, and our church was still growing. Because the call of God on your life and the presence of God in your life is not a respect of what you're going through. God's going to move despite what you're going through. But can I encourage you that before God wants to do something through you, he first wants to do something in you. And I remember going down to that basement where my wife was in rehab and I wanted to leave her and I went to counseling and I, I began, I was, I was not in a good place, y'all. And I went to the counselor, and the counselor said to me, she said, Jimmy, you cannot leave that girl. Because I had planned on leaving her, but not telling her until after she got back. So I had to deal with baby mama drama. <laughs> and the counselor said, if you give up, you will never get to experience the new Irene because the new Irene is going to heal the wounds that the old Irene created. But if you give up, you will carry the wounds of your last season to every season that you go to because you will follow you everywhere you go. And I got in that basement, and I'm lying. I got on my knees, and I started singing this song right here. When, when Lewis heard that song, he was like, oh, it's on tonight, y'all. Cause I hear the chains falling. She was in rehab, but I had to hear something. I hear the chains falling. You can stay right there. Just keep doing that, right? Because then I said, because this is how I fight my battle. See, sometimes you're fighting an enemy that you can't throw hands. You got to lay them. I'm telling you, man, I'm a living, breathing, walking, talking testimony that God can do anything. The Bible says that as they praise, suddenly they heard a sound. What I'm here to tell you is you've been going through issues for 20 and 30 and 10 and 15 and 5 years, but there's a suddenly here. I believe that the presence of God, that what you've been carrying around can change in an instant. If you would just surrender, come on somebody, but don't give up. I'm not saying surrender like saying I'm done. I'm saying surrender like saying I'm going to fight in the spirit for my family. I'm going to fight in the spirit for my church. I'm going to fight in the spirit to break every generational curse to come against every stronghold that has been against my mind I hear the chains does anybody hear them I hear the chains of freedom I hear the chains of freedom in this place I hear the chains falling here's what I want to know it's Sunday night so we can go a little deeper tonight it's Sunday night we don't have to say, everybody stand, everybody bow your head. If you need a breakthrough from God in any area of your life, I want you to run to this altar right now. This is a place of freedom. This is a place of deliverance. This is a place of joy. 
This is a place of breakthrough. This is a place. Come on. I'm here to tell you that the Spirit of God wants to accelerate you. The Spirit of God says what has taken 20 years and the enemy has locked you down. He can free in a moment. I break the spirit of addiction. I come against the spirit of fear. I come against the spirit of grief. I come against the spirit of shame and I release the spirit of freedom in this house. Come on, somebody. Let's give God a praise right now that shakes the generational strongholds. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You gotta find your people. Listen to me, you find your praise. And when you find your praise, after that, you go find a prisoner. Do you know what keeps me and Irene free? Is the fact that our freedom is not about us. Listen what the scripture says. The jailer woke up to see that the prison doors were wide open. And he assumed that the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted, stop, homie. Don't kill yourself. We are all here. Now listen what happens. Suicide then calls for the lights. It says that the jailer called for the lights. Suicide and shame called for the lights. Atheism called for the lights. Discouragement called for the lights. What Paul and Silas had no idea is somebody had to be willing to go to prison to not set themselves free, but to set the jailer free. Oh, I feel God. You have no idea that your greatest misery, that God wants to change it into your greatest ministry. And I I want you to trust me. I want everybody to put your hands up. These are not hands. These are spiritual antennas right now. For God to know the inner prison that you are in right now. And I pray for the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to come down and cause an earthquake on the inside of you. An earthquake of freedom. An earthquake of deliverance. An earthquake of breakthrough. In the name of Jesus, you will be set free. You will be healed. You will be delivered. Your best days are ahead of you. And your worst days are behind you. As the worship team begins to sing this song I want you to get inside of your situation and begin to break the chains loose of the prison that you have been in I declare freedom freedom come on in the name of Jesus come on let's say it there's power in the name Well, hey, I hope you received something from that message. I wonder if you've ever received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'd love to include you in a prayer. The Bible tells us that all we have to do is believe in our hearts, confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God raised Him from the dead and we are saved. We actually don't have to do anything except receive this beautiful gift from God. So I wonder if you've ever made that choice to invite Jesus in. I would love to lead you in a prayer right now. Why don't you just repeat after me? Dear Jesus, Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me and you rose again. Forgive me of my sins, of all the things I've done wrong. I choose today to be a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. We really believe in that moment, if you pray that prayer from your heart, you move from not knowing God to knowing God. You're saved. And we would love to help you in any way we can in the journey. Please reach out to us at colonialchurch.life and we'll do everything we can to help you on this beautiful new journey of faith. God bless you.